Hello and welcome back. This is the week 10 lecture. So today we continue our tour of literary criticism and theory by talking about structuralism and post-structuralism. So you remember last week we talked about formalism and reader response criticism. Those were our first two critical approaches or critical schools. So now we move on to our next couple of approaches. And structuralism and post-structuralism are related, obviously, as the names suggest. Structuralism comes along first, and then post-structuralism kind of builds off of structuralism using some of the foundation, but also doing some new and different things. So let's start with structuralism. It's kind of a tricky critical school. It's a little bit difficult to understand. It's very complex. What I'm offering here today, and also in my notes that you can find in the week 10 module, I'm offering a highly simplified kind of watered down version because we don't need to be experts, obviously. We just need to be able to use some of these critical approaches in our future work, or at least uh, we need to be able to use certain aspects of these approaches. So we don't need to be fully immersed in these different critical schools, but we need to be familiar with them. So I'm going to leave a lot out. I'm going to just try to sort of cover the highlights, and also you might want to use my notes uh, to sort of reinforce what you're listening to right now. So structuralism really is a theory. It is a, a critical school or theory that originates from structural linguistics, really. And it's a theory that was first developed by this Swiss linguist named Ferdinand de Saussure. And Saussure was not really looking at uh, literature. He was not really analyzing literary texts. Uh, that's not what structuralism was originally intended to do, but we can use it for that reason. But so Sir was a linguist, and we talked a little bit about linguistics last week. It's just the study of language, the history and the structures of language, how language works. And that's what he was interested in. So basically what he gives to us is a system or a theory that helps us to understand understand how language works, how language expresses or delivers meaning. So we can kind of see maybe how an approach like this could be useful in literary study, because obviously literary texts are examples of language. They are delivering meaning of some kind. So by better understanding the structures of language, we might be able to better understand literary texts. But a couple of things to note about the structuralist. So after Saussure kind of creates this model and shares it with the world, he's actually working back in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. But slowly his ideas start filtering down to other disciplines, other fields of study. So within a few decades, people working within the literature field, they're using this stuff. But typically when structuralists are working with literature, they're often not super interested in some of those traditional literary elements that we've been talking about. You know, stuff like plot, character, setting, theme. They're not really looking at those elements. They're a lot more focused on language the linguistic structure, individual words, sentences, and again, how meaning is expressed and delivered. Uh, so they're really kind of trying to understand how the literary text functions as a unit or an example of language. So they're very different from the formalists and quite a bit different from the reader response people as well. Unlike the formalists, uh, structuralists don't feel that there's only one correct reading or one correct interpretation of each literary text. And they're not super interested in interpretation the way we often think about it. Uh, they're really more focused on how the structure works, how the system works. 
Uh, so again, they're thinking about structures. They're thinking about systems of relationships. Uh, the things that allow words or really any cultural product to have meaning. Uh, so that's really where their focus rests. Um, and for them, literary texts work a lot like other cultural products. So this is another way that they diverge or differ from the formalist. Remember, the formalist said, hey, literature is a unique art form, and we need to have a really rigorous, almost scientific approach to literary texts in order to fully understand them and in order to correctly interpret them. Uh, structuralists would say, well, no, not really. Literature functions a lot like other things that we consume in our culture, whether it be architecture or fashion or furniture or politics uh, even marriage. They talk about marriage sort of working as a structure, as a system. Uh, so these are all cultural systems or structures that we rely on, we consume, we use them, and they all have meaning. All of these different structures, whether it's marriage, whether it's fashion, whether it's a particular like architectural, uh, architectural style, uh, all of these things are delivering certain kinds of meanings. Uh, and a literary text is no different. So that's really what they're looking at and sort of how their approach differs uh, from what we were looking at uh, last week. So again, structuralism, not initially designed for the study of literature, but we can apply it to literature. It was originally a linguistic theory um, that was designed to really show us how language works. So I think this is actually pretty cool and fun. Very interesting if we just sort of think about some of the key terms and concepts that Saussure has handed down to us. And we still use this. I mean, we're, we're still kind of using his model, his theory, to help us understand how language works. So I've included the following terms and concepts in the notes for this week. So just make sure you're comfortable with all these terms. We're going to go over them right now. We start with... Uh, La Langue, uh, language. He's a French speaking Swiss guy, so sir. So these are all, you know, kind of based on his own native language, which I do think was French. Uh, but La Langue, that is just language. Uh, any language, English, French, Russian, uh, Hebrew, it does not matter. They're all systems. All languages work according to certain structural rules. Right? They all have certain rules or procedures that speakers of that language have to learn. And we don't think about a lot of those rules often because we learned them when we were very young. We often don't really remember our own language acquisition, at least when it comes to our first language, our native language, because we were doing that work at such an early age, oftentimes our memories do not go back that far. So it's kind of useful to, to get detailed and specific and really break this stuff down because we often don't think about language in great detail. We just kind of take it for granted because we can all speak uh, our native language. We're all English speakers. Now, maybe some of us aren't native English speakers, but... Um, no matter what your native language is, you had to learn the rules at a very early age. Uh, and that's true for everyone. So uh, we, you know, we internalize those rules and those rules are necessary, right? These structural relationships and these rules, they get internalized by all members of a particular language group. So if you are an English speaker, you have to learn these rules. Uh, you have to learn certain structures in the way the language works in order to communicate with other English speakers. Okay, so we, we get that. The next concept is la parole, uh, which really just refers to any specific application of a language in speech or writing. So this is like a manifestation or an example of the language. Uh, usually it's going to be expressed either phonetically, uh, which means we are hearing 
the speech. We are hearing somebody talk. Okay, so we're hearing language spoken. Or the language can be expressed semantically, which means through writing. And we get this, right? We're either going to listen to language or we are going to read language. Those are our two basic options when we are the receivers. We're either listening to people talk or we are reading something on the page. Okay, so those are the most common kinds of speech events uh, in most languages, either spoken language or written language. So paroles often will take the form of individual words or signs. And this is where I think it gets interesting for us, just kind of a cool thing to think about. So a sign uh, is a sort of basic linguistic unit. It's a two-part linguistic unit. Every sign, and again, signs are generally just individual words in a language. So any sign is going to have two parts. Okay, it is a two-part or a, you know, it's a two-part linguistic unit. So part one is what we call the signifier. And part two is the signified. All right, so let's run through these. Let's break it down. So let's take a very common word. In the English language, tree, the word tree, okay, T-R-E-E, -E. that's a sign, all right? So let's take a look at the signifier and the signified contained within this very simple sign, all right? So if you are reading, if you are reading a short story or a poem or a play and you come across this word, okay, then you are consuming it or absorbing it. You're absorbing the signifier as a series of letters. So you see the letters T-R-E-E, -E, and that's the signifier. Okay, so it's a sequence of letters if you are reading. If you are listening to somebody talk, it's going to be the sound. The signifier is the sound that that word makes when somebody says it out loud. Now, again, we often don't think about the signifier very much because we can all read. So when we see a word, we immediately recognize it, especially if it's a common, simple word that everybody knows, like tree. Some words might send you scrambling for a dictionary, but a word like tree, we're not going to think about it. Okay, but the letters or the sound that that word makes, those are the signifiers. Okay, the letters that you see on the page or the sound that you hear. Okay, those are the signifiers. And then the signified is the concept that we think of or the mental picture that we form in our mind when we see those letters or we hear that sound. And this is all subconscious. This is all happening so fast and it's so instinctive. We don't actually we don't often stop and really break down the process. But when you see those letters T R E E on the page, you immediately have a mental image of a tree or you at least think about the concept that those letters are supposed to represent. We all know what a tree looks like. So you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. But when you see those letters or when you hear the sound tree, immediately, unconsciously, effortlessly, you think about a tree. <laughs> At least for a split second, you think about that concept. You think about something that grows out of the ground and it has a trunk and branches and leaves. That mental image comes to your mind. So the, so the signified is that mental image, okay? It's that concept. It's the actual meaning of the word. And it's going to come to you immediately upon reading or hearing the signifier. So again, the signifier would be the individual letters or the sound that the word makes. And the signified is what the word actually means or that mental image that comes to your mind, that concept that you see or think of when you come across that word. 
So, so Sarah shows us that this is basically how language works, right? <laughs> this is how we understand language. This is how we use language. And again, most uh, people don't really think about it very much because this is all so natural. And it all happens very quickly without a lot of extra effort on our parts. But so Sir points out, this is all a little bit strange, uh, this relationship between signifier and signified, it often seems very logical, very obvious, but there might not always be a lot of natural relationships between signifier and signified. Um, we know the rules, we know the structure, we know the system because we know the language. Uh, but that's important to remember. This stuff is only going to make sense within the larger system of the language that we all speak. Um, and sometimes if we really think about this relationship, we can see how it's often rather strange. Uh, it's not purely a physical event that we're going through right now, but it's also not purely mental. There's a little bit of physical and mental combined, and this is how language works. But let's think of another example. Let's think of a word that's actually pretty new, and it's only been around for a few decades. So unlike the word tree, which has been around for a long time and everybody is clear on what it signifies, what it's supposed to mean, think about a word like Google, <laughs> uh, which was not around 20, 25 years ago. It's obviously a byproduct of the technology age, the internet boom, all of that. Uh, so think about the word Google. Uh, and we can look at this same kind of structure, this same kind of system, right? So the, so the sign here is the word Google. And the signifier, once again, will be the individual letters or the sound that word makes when somebody says it. Okay, and then the signified, what the word actually means is an internet search engine, right? Um, but as we know, we can actually use Google in a couple of different ways. It can be a verb or a noun. So I can tell you to go Google something, okay? I'm using it as a verb there. It's actually an action that you can complete, but it's also a noun. It's a company, uh, and it is a, uh, you know, it's a database, it's an online search engine that all of us use. But let's just use it as a noun for right now, okay? Uh, so again, let's think about this relationship between the signifier and the signified, okay? So the signified uh, is, once again, an online search engine. But notice that there's nothing in those letters, uh, there's nothing in the sound that the word makes that would immediately lead us to think about an online search engine, right? Uh, Google, that sound that the word makes or the individual letters, the G's, the O's, there's nothing inherent in those signifiers. There's nothing logical in those signifiers that would immediately scream search engine, <laughs> right? We know the relationship between signifier and signified because we know the rules of our language. We know the words in our language, but there's nothing necessarily logical or natural about this relationship. There's no inherent connection between G's and O's and an L and an E and internet search engine. Right? There's nothing about those letters that automatically equals internet search engine. <laughs> and similarly, when we hear the word spoken, there's nothing about that sound that immediately screams search engine. Uh, we only know the relationship between signifier and signified because we are in the system. We exist inside the system or the structure of the English language. And it's the same deal with the word tree, with that sign. There's nothing inherent in the T, the R, and the double E that represents something growing out of the ground, right? 
And people point this out often, linguists and people in other related fields will say, you know, we could really replace a lot of our current words with other different words and the relationships are no less logical, right? There's nothing natural about the letters T-R-E-E -E representing a large piece of vegetation. That was just something that we all agreed on <laughs> as English speakers. We just accepted that T-R-E-E -E equals this big thing growing up out of the ground. Um, but there's nothing natural about that. It's a system that was created by people, and we all kind of agree to follow the rules and that's how the language is able to function, and that's how we're able to understand each other. But really, the relationship between signifier and signified is often kind of arbitrary. Um, we just sort of make it up, and it's only going to make sense within a specific language system. So obviously, if we go to a different language, uh, the concept of tree... It, that signified is going to be expressed through different letters, uh, through a different sound, right? Other languages have other different words meaning tree. So that kind of tells us, that indicates that there's nothing natural or necessarily logical about these relationships between signifier and signify. Uh, the words will change in different languages. So it's not like the only way to express tree is to use the letters T-R-E-E -E, or to use the sound that English speakers make when they say the word. That's just our system. That's just our structure. Other structures are different, but everybody that exists within our structure, within our English speaking system, we all get it, we understand it, and we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. But whenever we add a new word to our vocabulary, like Google, which people didn't use, it wasn't a word in the 80s or like the first half of the 90s. Uh, so it's a new word. And I think with new words, we can really see how arbitrary these relationships are, right? There's nothing about the word Google that necessarily makes it represent a search engine. That's just what we've all come to understand. We understand that relationship. It works within our language system, but we could change it. And other language systems uh, will use different signifiers to express the same signified. So language is tricky. Uh, that's one of our big takeaways here. Um, and again, we stuff with language is only going to make sense within a particular system or structure. So going back to literary texts... You know, we can look at them as structures or systems that exist within larger systems. So any literary text written in English obviously has to follow the rules of the larger system or structure of the English language. That's the only way we're going to be able to read it or listen to it. So we can use a lot of these structural concepts when we analyze literature. Um, because again, what structuralism really wants to do is kind of explain how language works based on certain structural rules or hierarchies. So literature is just one of many avenues that we can take in order to do that. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, there were uh, a lot of other sort of schools or related groups of critics, uh, related schools of criticism that uh, started using structuralism in their analysis of literature. So there was a group of Russian critics who are sometimes called Russian formalists because a lot of what they were doing is related uh, to the formalists in the U.S., but they also started to apply Saussure's so theories to literature, uh, liter literary text. And they were looking at like Russian folktales and a lot of stuff that we don't read. Uh, but they noticed uh, 
certain patterns. They noticed certain underlying structures that kept showing up in all of these different folk tales, in all of these different examples of Russian literature. So like the formalists in the U.S., they were looking for those patterns. They were looking for repetitions, things that kept showing up, things like irony. Uh, paradox, tension, all the stuff we were talking about with the formalists. But they also noticed that there were certain character types. There were certain kinds of narrative events uh, that kept showing up. So for them, those character types and those plot points, they were structural. They were part of a larger structure that helped to organize certain genres of popular Russian literature. So they were focusing on these patterns, these recurrences, and they noticed that there were certain structures in place that they could study, that they could make observations about, that they could observe and analyze. So that's kind of how structuralists within the world of literary studies continue to operate today. And other structuralists notice that certain kinds of literature, particularly poetry, uh, tended to sort of make language strange, to make language kind of unfamiliar, different, weird to the reader in various ways. And I think you guys can relate to that. Uh, just remember reading Keats or maybe even reading Plath's poem. You guys, a lot of you picked up, what you know, Plath's poem was pretty easy to understand, but a lot of you got, just in terms of the words and, you know, her structure was pretty easy to understand, but a lot of you noticed that, you know, there was some weird stuff going on by the end of that poem. It kind of starts one way, kind of optimistic, kind of happy. We're focused on kind of beautiful, natural settings. And then by the end, we're kind of scared. We're on the beach. There's a lot of kind of scary imagery. She seems that, you know, the speaker seems a lot less certain. Um, a little bit angsty, a little bit nervous, perhaps, as we leave the Blackberry uh, lanes and we approach the ocean. So that's very much what they're talking about here. That's what a lot of poetry does. It sort of makes us feel weird or different, and that's very much a function of the language. The language is often going to be figurative, not literal. And again, that's how the language becomes less familiar, right? A lot of poems will move us away from typical or sort of everyday literal meanings of words. And it will move us towards more figurative meanings, uh, more complex intellectual realms that take us out of the everyday experience that we might be more comfortable in. And we have to think about alternative meanings of words. Or we have to think about symbols. You know, what does this metaphor mean? Why is she using figurative language right here? Uh, is, again, it's supposed to take us away from the ordinary. It's supposed to take us away from the literal. All literature can do that. And other genres of literature definitely do that. But poetry does it perhaps the most often, and it's easiest to see it in poetry. So a lot of structuralists, again, they're interested in how the poems are making things strange. How are they making things less familiar? Well, they're doing that through words. They're doing that through individual words. So how do those words function? And how do those words operate within a larger system or structure? Those are the kinds of questions structuralists might ask. So for them, for a lot of structuralists, individual literary texts are considered to be paroles. Uh, they are sort of uh, examples of uh, a, a speech act. They are specific applications of language. Okay, just like an individual word could be, but they're kind of expanding the definition of parole to think of it as including any, uh, consisting of any literary text. Uh, so 
using that sort of logic, if a, if a poem is a parole, it's an example of language at work, okay? Uh, then maybe the larger literary genre that that particular text belongs to, that larger genre is kind of functioning like an overall language. So if an individual poem is an example of a parole, a, a speech event, uh, an application of language in a specific time and place, then we can think of poetry as a whole as, as sort of operating as a language. A, a, a unique language that's different from other languages. So that might be a useful way to think about some of the texts that we study. An individual poem is the parole and poetry as a whole is its own language with its own rules, with its own structures, its own hierarchies. And the individual poems within that larger genre, they have to follow some of those rules. They have to abide by some of those structures in order for their meaning to be clear. Uh, so, yeah, uh, hopefully that's a pretty good overview um, and again, what, what Saussure really liked to do, um, and then other linguists who came along after him, like Levi Strauss, uh, they were looking at these sort of embedded structures, these deeper meanings that might be unlocked with any kind of text. It doesn't have to be literature. They would have been just as interested uh, in non-literary texts. Uh, but by, by figuring out the structure, we can always unlock sort of larger meanings. So Levi Strauss was a cultural anthropologist. He wasn't really working with language specifically at all, but he was inspired by Saussure and he used a lot of Saussure's ideas to help him study human societies, different cultures, different human cultures. That's what anthropologists do, but he was kind of doing similar work. He was looking at structures within those cultures. And by understanding the structures, he figured he could understand the culture. So an anthropologist like him would very much be looking at marriage rituals and other kinship sort of rich, like, like, you know, kinship, how it works, like different family, you know, familial relationships, um, different aspects of culture. They're all structural, just like languages. So there's always a structure. There are always rules. And once we understand that stuff, we'll be better able to understand the culture. Just like if we can understand the rules and the structure of language, whether we're defining language as English or as poetry, uh, if we can understand the structures, we'll be able to understand how these texts are delivering meaning. Uh, all right, so that's probably enough on just sort of the basics of structuralism. But there was another related school of French structuralists that came along around the middle of the 20th century, and they sort of took that basic Saucerian approach to texts, and they built on it. They accepted a lot of his premises, uh, but they were also contributing some new ideas. So for them, a narrative was very similar to an individual sentence, right? It's made up of individual parts that can be analyzed. So for them, a narrative was simply a sequence of events from beginning to end. Uh, and they could analyze any one of those events in a way that uh, a structuralist could have done with an individual sentence or even the individual parts of a word. So again, they're taking Saucer's ideas, but they're adapting them a little bit more for literature. Right? So they're taking some of his ideas and applying them to narratives so we can really get into the literature. But they're also distinguishing between narrative and discourse. So the narrative is just sort of the events of the plot. But the discourse for French structuralists would have been sort of how that narrative gets arranged or rearranged or restructured for various reasons, aesthetic reasons or other reasons. 
So this is kind of interesting. It kind of takes us back to what we were talking about with literary elements at the beginning of the semester. Remember, we talked about the plot, but also the sequence of the plot. So we can identify the plot of any narrative, the events that transpire, but then we have a sequence. Are those events unfolded in chronological order, first to last? Or do we have flashbacks, flash forwards? Do we jump around in time? That's kind of what the French structuralists were interested in. And they talked about various types of what they call discursive manipulation. That's a complicated term. All it means is the different ways we can kind of mess around with the discourse, with the arrangement of the narrative. So this just means like manipulation of the discourse just means flashbacks, uh, flash forwards, unequal treatments of time, uh, or a lot of other things, even stuff like exposition. Uh, characters speaking directly to the audience, you know, giving us asides. They said all of that can be viewed as sort of manipulation. These are all ways that the author can manipulate the discourse, the arrangement of the narrative, the arrangement of the plot. And, and they're doing all of these things for artistic reasons. Uh, sometimes they're doing these things just to be cool or different. Sometimes they're doing these things in order to deliver their meaning. Uh, you know, shifts in viewpoint, uh, jumps ahead in time or back in time. All of these things are affecting the reader or the viewer in various ways, but um, there are various ways to manipulate the, uh, the, the sequence of events. So they were very interested in that. And also this particular group of structuralists, these were mostly French guys, and they were sort of anti-author. Uh, they were a little bit similar to the older formalists in this way. They rejected any really detailed consideration of authors. And one of these guys, Roland Barthes, uh, it's kind of a famous French structuralist. He famously talks about how the author is dead. <laughs> and he's not speaking literally. That's just sort of this larger idea that these guys had. Basically saying, don't, don't worry about what the author intended. Don't worry about what the author really meant. And you don't need to worry that much about the author's biography. Uh, what they claim, what Bart claimed, is that authorship is really just a rearrangement of already existing structures and codes and rules, which kind of sounds out there. A lot of people respond negatively when they first hear that particular uh, claim because they're like, oh, come, you know, come on. Authors are very talented. Authors are obviously artists. Let's not dismiss them. Let's not be mean to them. But I think there is a kernel of truth in what Bart is saying. And again, it goes back to his larger belief in structures. <laughs> um, all of these structures of language, they already exist. All of these rules, uh, all of these different signs with their signifiers and their signifieds, all of that exists. So he's saying that writers are kind of more just like skilled craftsmen, like they're just coming along to work with the lumber or the glass and they're making something out of it. So yeah, they are playing a role. Um, but they're not really creating new stuff. They are rearranging. They are manipulating discourse. They're working within these structural systems to create novels, poems, and plays, short stories, or whatever else. But he's saying, really, it's the structure that matters, not the individual authors. So that became a pretty influential and very controversial position. Not everybody agrees, obviously, but it is an interesting approach to take. Um, so again, they're looking for codes, rules, uh, and structural hierarchies that make meaning possible. But a lot of critics and scholars have pointed out that structuralism does not give us a great opportunity to interpret texts. Uh, mostly because, uh, again, they're not, structuralists aren't really always interested in getting at the meaning of the text. They're more interested in how the structure of the text works. 
So how meaning is created, not necessarily what that meaning is, if that makes sense. Uh, what, you know, what allows meaning to be conveyed? Uh, that's what they're mostly interested in, not in what people might think the meaning really is. So structuralism does give us a great opportunity to identify certain features, certain patterns. Okay, it's great for that. And it can also help us to compare texts. We can compare different texts that might have similar structures. Or like I was saying earlier, we can compare two different poems who both exist within the structure of a larger language, whether that language be English or if we define the language as poetry. So it gives us a lot of material for comparison, and it certainly helps us to identify certain features, particularly linguistic features. So we're looking at those recurring patterns that the Russian formalists were looking at, and yeah, sometimes that will allow us to look at character types or plot points but again we're not so interested in the characters for themselves we're interested in them as a structurally reoccurring thing uh, it's part of this larger system this character type is part of this larger system and a lot of times those character types will almost function like signifiers uh, when we meet a certain character, uh, as soon as we see that character or hear that character or meet that character, we think certain things. We have pictures in our minds. We have concepts that we think of. Um, so they're more interested in how characters are structural features or how plot points are structural features. But obviously they're interested in words and they can also, structuralism also gives us a chance to dig a little bit more into figurative language because that can be a very important part of certain language structures. Like we were saying, with poetry, obviously figurative language plays a big role. So we could do a lot with individual metaphors or similes. Um, and really any kind of word choice, any individual word is fair game for a structural analysis. Uh, so yeah, but for a lot of critics and scholars, structuralism is a valuable tool, but it's not the only tool that they want to use because it can be a little bit limited when it comes to the interpretation part of what we do. But when it comes to identifying features and elements and analyzing some of those features and elements, structuralism can really help out a lot. Okay, so let me take a little break here. And let's very quickly cover post-structuralism. So this comes along, this school or approach comes along late 60s into the 1970s. It's sort of big in Europe initially. And then it migrates over to the U.S. not long afterwards. So a lot in, the, in much the same way that reader response criticism was kind of a response to formalism, uh, post-structuralism is kind of a response to structuralism. Uh, they're taking the foundations that Saussure gave us, those basic structuralist foundations, and they're building some new stuff on top. But they're also making some important uh, departures. They are differing from the structuralists in a few important ways. So we can refer to this school as post-structuralists or deconstructionists. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. Post-structuralism and deconstruction are synonymous. They are two words that basically mean the same thing. And they both are uh, going to be sort of used interchangeably by me and by a lot of other people who talk about this. But one key difference to keep in mind here, and it's something that we should all be able to understand, structuralism was primarily focused on grammatical structures, semantic structures. So they're focused on words. <laughs> Remember, it comes from ling uh, linguistics. So we're focused on words and how words deliver meaning. Okay, so we're on kind of a grammatical level with the structuralists. But the post-structuralists are operating on more of a rhetorical level. 
Okay, so if those of you who took 102, you might have remem- you might remember a little bit about rhetoric. You may have learned a little bit about rhetoric. Basically, rhetoric is a broad term that can apply to any kind of speaking or writing that's often designed to persuade. It's often designed to convince an audience. So a lot of different things uh, can qualify as rhetoric. Speeches, uh, news articles, essays, but also certain works of fiction, as we know, are making arguments. They are trying to persuade people to accept a certain view or to adopt a certain belief. So rhetoric is a really broad term. It's not unique to written text. A lot of rhetoric can be delivered uh, through speech, through spoken speech. Uh, But also, we can find rhetoric in all sorts of different texts. Uh, But typically, rhetoric is used to persuade people or to basically get an audience to do what you want them to do. Okay, So, uh, post-structuralists are a lot more focused on the rhetorical features and structures of literary texts. They're not as interested in those grammatical structures that Saussure was looking at, but they're using a lot of Saussure's ideas. They're just applying those ideas to rhetorical features rather than grammatical features. So, for example, they accept that basic relationship um, but that the structuralist kind of came up with that says, okay, uh, sentence structure, like individual sentences or syntax, that's kind of equal to individual literary texts. Um, so they kind of accept that idea of using the idea of parole, a single parole, a single sort of speech act, kind of seeing that as a literary text kind of uh, just like a sentence can be broken down into all of its individual elements, its grammatical elements, we can break a literary text down into all of its rhetorical elements. So that's kind of the level that they're on. But unlike the structuralist who were looking for the way meaning is conveyed, they were looking for order, they were looking for structure, uh, the deconstructionists, as the word kind of suggests, they're focused more on the disorder of texts. The chaos of language is kind of their big thing. One of their big ideas is that language often contradicts itself. Language is often not straightforward. It's not clear. And oftentimes texts deconstruct themselves. They take themselves apart uh, rather than providing these kind of stable, clear meanings. So that's why a lot of people don't like this camp. A lot of people think they're kind of nihilistic. They're very focused on looking at contradictions. Uh, And not everybody likes that. Some people think that they're just being difficult. Um, And really, they reject the basic notion that written language will have a stable, unchanging meaning. They reject that. A lot of structuralists would say, yeah, as long as you understand the structure, the meaning is going to be constant, it's going to be stable, it's going to be clear, no problem. I mean, remember, the structuralists acknowledge that, yeah, this is kind of arbitrary, the way it works, the relationship between signifier and signified, it's not natural, it's a man-made system, but as long as you understand the rules, words are going to make sense. Language is going to make sense, and most of these meanings won't really change that much over time. But the deconstructionists say, no, no, you're wrong about that. Language is constantly changing, and language does not give us a lot of stable meanings. Uh, We might think it does, but that's really just an illusion. So for them, there is no absolute constant meaning. And like I said, a lot of people think that's kind of nihilistic, that's anarchy, we don't like that. But they're not just doing it to do it. I mean, they are making larger points. Um, And one of the most prominent deconstructionists, this French guy named Jacques Derrida, 
he claims that the whole Western world, the whole Western literary tradition that we're studying in this class basically suppresses thought and it suppresses individuality by limiting language. Derrida says if language was left to its own devices, it would be limitless. There would be unlimited meanings that we could pull out of different examples of language, different texts. But the powers that be uh, don't want that, right? Uh, the people who are in charge, they don't want unlimited possibility. They don't want unlimited meaning. So they control language. They make you know, these hard boundaries. They draw these lines and say, the word means this, not that. This means this, not that. And Derrida says, this is really a tradition that you can find in Western Europe. You find it in the U.S. And he says, uh, really, the only way to fight back is to open language up and to just embrace the messiness of language. Embrace the unknowability of of language, acknowledge that language is not stable, cannot be stable. Uh, the meanings change, and I think we can see a little bit of what he's talking about. Uh, we add new words to our language all the time, and being a little bit older now, I certainly get uh, sort of disoriented and confused by certain new words, new phrases. I'm talking about slang, of course, but we see this. Every generation has their own slang vocabulary that doesn't make sense to older people. But we know the meanings of words change. The ways that we use words over time changes. Um, so I think Derrida is right to an extent, uh, but he also acknowledges that as a French-speaking guy uh, who writes in French, he's controlled by this same system. There's no getting out of the structure. There's no getting outside of language. So he'll acknowledge in his own writing, even as he encourages people to try to break free from the limitations of language that have been imposed on us, he says, I don't even really know how to do that because all I can do is speak in French. All I can do is write in French. So I'm still bound by these same rules, these same laws that govern the language, just like everybody else. But I'm acknowledging that there are limitations here and maybe in the future we can do something different. Uh, another interesting thing that the deconstructionists do is they kind of get rid of the signified. <laughs> they say that the signified doesn't really matter that much. They're more interested in signifiers and they're more interested in the relationship between signifiers because, again, they're, they're taking that basic claim from Saucere, which is the, the relationship between signifier and signified is arbitrary. It's just kind of made up. Everybody agrees on it, and then we use it. So a lot of them were saying, yeah, it's so arbitrary that we could really just kind of look at words in a very different way. We could just look at the relationships between signifiers, because oftentimes the only way that we're going to understand one particular signifier is to look at other similar related signifiers, right? So one way to understand what a tree is, imagine that you're an alien new to earth and you're not familiar with our vegetation here, so you don't know what a tree is. So without having any understanding of the signified, uh, when you see the signifier, when you see those four letters, or when you hear the, the sound that the word makes, it's not going to make any sense to you. You're going to be like, what? What is a tree? I, I don't know what a tree is. I don't know what T-R-E-E -E is supposed to represent. So these French guys were saying, yeah, one way that you might explain it to an alien like that is you would just use other signifiers. You would say, oh, well, a tree, and actually dictionaries do this. Uh, that was part of their evidence. They said this is a common method that we use even with other humans who do know the language. But one way to, un to understand a tree is to be told, okay, a tree is bigger than a bush, but it's 
um, you know, and a bush is bigger than a house plant. So you're going to like compare it to other similar related words, which will, will often also function as signifiers. So they're saying really you can learn a lot about signifiers simply by looking at other signifiers. You don't even need that basic relationship between signifier and signified. And again, they're saying signified, that concept that we're supposed to understand, that image we're supposed to see in our mind, that's unreliable because it's not going to work the same for every person, right? And even the mental image that I have, when I see the word tree, I might be thinking of an oak tree, a very specific type of tree. And some other person, when they see the word or hear the word, the signified that functions for them, it might be a different kind of tree. It might look very different. You know, some would say it's not really super accurate to use one word to refer to all of these different kinds of uh, plant life. Right. So, again, they're saying you can't rely on that relationship between signifier and signified. It's very unstable. Uh, even if we're all members of the same language group and we all know the basic rules, we're not all going to arrive at the same mental image when we see the word tree. And again, think about the word Google. I think that really makes their point effectively because you know, 15, 20 years ago, somebody who wasn't very knowledgeable about the internet had not really been online. Uh, that relationship between signifier and signified is not going to make sense to a person who's not been online, right? Google, what's a Google? What is that supposed to mean? So you could explain Google by using other signifiers, by using other words that are supposed to represent concepts or images. So again, deconstructionists would say, what's so great about the relationship between signifier and signified? It's arbitrary. It's made up. So we can make up other relationships too that might work just as well. And that's what they mean about how volatile and unstable language really is. Language is evolving. It's changing. Uh, linguists will tell you that the English language has changed a lot over the course of uh, over history. So, you know, we don't have to accept all of their ideas, but they're very interested in how language often sort of undercuts itself. Again, contradicts itself, deconstructs itself. And this takes us a little bit back to what the formalists were talking about with irony, tension, and paradox. They were always looking for moments in a text where there seemed to be a contradiction. There seemed to be some kind of paradox. If you guys look at the examples of formalism uh, that I posted, you'll notice that they do that. Uh, so there might be some kind of disconnect between what a character wants and what a character ends up getting. Or there might be a disconnect between the literal meaning of something versus the figurative meaning of something. So again, that's a form of contradiction. Maybe that can be resolved. See, formalists would say we can always resolve those contradictions if we're reading the text the right way. But a post-structuralist or a deconstructionist would say there's really no way to resolve it. Uh, there's just two opposite meanings. And you can do with that whatever you want to do with that. Uh, what does that contradiction mean? Uh, does it indicate that we are, uh, you know, beyond the point of resolution or is there a way to make it right? But you have to grapple with that as an individual reader. And again, they're interested in rhetorical features. So not so much the grammar, but rather how the text is, uh, you know, delivering a particular uh, idea or a particular argument. So again, that might be conveyed through literary elements. Uh, so they might be looking at characters. They might be looking at specific instances of dialogue. They, they could also look at irony. Basically, any of our literary elements would be fair game for a rhetorical 
uh, approach because they can all be considered rhetorical features. But words and statements can also be rhetorical features um, because they're all designed to tell us things, to, to make us feel or think certain things. But just remember that key difference. With the structuralist, it's really about grammar and it's about how words work. For the deconstructionist, or the post-structuralist, it's more about rhetoric, the arguments that the text is making, uh, the ideas that the text is expressing. So uh, there's still a structure to examine. And again, they're accepting that, yeah, we all learn the structures of our language. We all learn the systems. We all learn the rules. But they differ from the structuralist by saying we can just kind of move away from some of those rules. We don't always have to abide by them, and we should notice that language has limitless meanings. Um, if we're not always bound by certain rules in certain structures, we'll notice that language can mean a lot of different things. Literary texts can mean a lot of different things. Uh, there is no one set meaning, and meanings can also change over time. All right, so that's enough. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. If you have questions, let me know. Use the notes that uh, you see in the week 10 module. And next week, we move on to feminism and gender studies.